grace. 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 Okay, tonight in uh, through the Bible, we are uh, going through First Samuel thirteen through fifteen. Uh, to go further wouldn't have been productive because it gets into something else. So, uh, starting in chap- uh, chapter thirteen, verse one says, "Saul was thirty years old when he became king, and he reigned forty-two years over Israel. He chose three thousand men from Israel for himself. Two thousand were with Saul of Michmash, and in Bethel's hill country." And 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. Now, it's going to tell you in a little while, but Benjamin is his son. So, uh, he sent the rest of the troops away, each to his own tent. Verse 3. Jonathan attacked the Philistine garrison that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. So, Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear, and all the Israelites heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine garrison, and Israel is now repulsive to the Philistines. Then the troops were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines also gathered to to fight against Israel, 3,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Then they went up and camped at Michmash, um, east of beth The men of Israel saw that they were in trouble because the troops were in a difficult situation. So they hid in the caves and thickets and among rocks and in holes and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul, however, was still at Gilgal, and all his troops were uh, gripped with fear. He waited seven days for the appointed time that Samuel had set. But Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and the troops were deserting him. So Saul said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. Then he offered burnt offerings. Just as he uh, finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. So Saul went out to greet him. And Samuel asked, What have you done? Saul answered, When I saw that the troops were deserting me, and you didn't come at the appointed time, uh, or within the appointed days, and the Philistines were gathering at Michmash, I thought the Philistines will now descend on me at Gilgal. And I have sought the Lord's favor, so I forced myself to offer the burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, You have been foolish. You have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God gave you. It was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel. But now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man loyal to him, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not done what the Lord commanded." Now, before we go any further, let's look at that. Uh, This presents, if any of you are really paying attention uh, to all that we've covered in the past, this presents an interesting problem because even though the Bible was clear about priests being the only ones who are to offer sacrifices and that once they enter the promised land, all sacrifices and altars are to be in the place where the Lord chose to place his name, which was at Shiloh. Yet, back in Judges uh, chapter 6, verse 26, We have Gideon from the tribe of Manasseh building an altar and offering a burnt offering, a burnt sacrifice on it in Ophrah, which is not in Silo, and he's not a priest. Um, It says in Judges 6.26, build a well-constructed altar to the Lord your God on the top of this rock, take a second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the astra pole that you cut down. So that's what he did. Also, if you go to Judges 11.31, which I'm not having you go there, I'm just mentioning them in passing, just as examples. Uh, In Judges 11.31, we have Jephthah promising to offer a burnt offering. He didn't wind up offering it uh, because it wound up being his daughter that came out first. um, And so he dedicated her to the, uh, um, the tabernacle. But the truth of the matter is, he had made a promise to God that he would offer a burnt offering. And if God would, um, cause the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the battle to go well, and God honored that vow, indicating that he would have accepted the burnt offering from Jephthah. Um, in Judges 12, 13, 16, we have Manoah from the tribe of, of Dan, who lived in Zoah, uh, Zorah, and he offered a burnt offering to the Lord on a rock. And finally, in, in Samuel 7, 1 Samuel 7, we have Samuel himself, the prophet from the tribe of Dan, offering burnt offerings in Mizpah. All of these happened without incident. God didn't get upset. No one died. It was all okay. 
However, we get to Saul doing it, and he gets judged for it. Why? Well, uh, you know, I've spent some time with this, and I don't personally know a straightforward answer to it, but in the case of Jephthah, of course, he didn't actually offer a sacrifice, and since God knew that his daughter would be the first one to come out to meet him after returning from the battle, perhaps that's why God went along with it and honored the vow, because he knew he wasn't going to be able to do it anyway. Um, in the cases of Gideon and Manoah, they were told to do it by the Lord, and the acceptance of it was made clear by God igniting the sacrifice by himself. Uh, they didn't have to light the fire, God lit the fire. So when it was, uh, uh, so while it was still technically a breach of the law, it was by the approval of the lawmaker himself. So it was, in the end, a just decision. In the case of Samuel, his was offered during a time when Shiloh had been destroyed and the ark taken. So there was no official place where God's name dwelt among the people and therefore no place to offer sacrifices. Also, as in the other cases we just read, the times that Samuel offered sacrifice, he seems to have done so by the direction of God. So in the three examples we have, since God said only priests do this, that other people other than priests did it and it was accepted, was all at the bidding of God. So thus, when Saul comes along and does this, um, God, you know, God is a respecter of the authority that he delegates. So, um, Saul was Israel's first official national leader and commander. And as such, he would be held up as an example. Therefore, we, uh, we would naturally, um, be, he would naturally be suspect, um, subject to a stricter censor than a common person would be. But beyond that, um, so I mean, therefore God would have judged him pretty quickly about it. Uh, as things play out, as we watch, as we keep on reading, God was not very, was not super harsh with Saul. He just removed the possibility of his heir becoming the uh, the king to take over after him. Saul still largely ruled entirely uh, through had an entire reign. I mean, even though God removed him, uh, he still reigned until I think what it was uh, we read earlier. He was seventy or seventy five. So he he reigned for I guess it was forty. Uh, he was seventy two. He reigned for forty two years. So, and that's another pattern we see with God. When God judges, it, the judgment doesn't always happen right away. God's not in a hurry to mete out judgment. He's very merciful. And so, you know, but Saul did several things wrong. The first and foremost one we're dealing with right now is that he took it upon himself to do something that God did not give him the okay to do. And he knew from being an Israelite, this is something only priests are supposed to do. And so, and it says, he, you can even kind of get a hint of it in the wording he used. He said, I forced myself as though he was doing God a favor. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to do it, but you know, I kind of had to. I'm like, no, 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 not so much. You didn't have to. You forced yourself to burnt the uh, burnt offering. And uh, now God's being forced to remove you as king, or at least your posterity as king. So now other things that are behind this, um, decision to offer up a burnt offering without being a priest will show up as we're reading. But the first one was he dishonored God, just like Samuel said, he did not obey the command that God gave. And that was priests are the only ones that offer it. They only offered in Shiloh and they only offered on official altars. Um, obviously God has got the right because he's the lawmaker to amend those judgments. Uh, but he did not with Saul, and so Saul was judged. So now we're picking up in verse 15. Then Samuel went from Gilgal to Gibeah in Benjamin. Saul registered the troops who were with him, about 600 men. Saul, his son Jonathan, and the troops who were with them were staying at Gibeah of Benjamin, and the Philistines were camped at Michmash. Raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp in three divisions. One division headed toward Ophrah, uh, the Ophrah road leading to the land of Shua, or Shual. Uh, the next division headed toward Beth Horon, ro uh, the Beth Horon road, and the last division headed uh, down to the border road that lo uh, looks out over the valley of Zeboam toward the wilderness. Now, no blacksmith could be found in all of the land of Israel because the Philistines had said, 
Otherwise, the Hebrews will make swords and spears. So, because they were still, at this point, under Philistine rule, which is what this battle is all about. So, while they were, since they've been under Philistine captivity, the Philistines took away the ability to do any type of uh, ironwork or craftsmanship like uh, like uh, blacksmith. So, uh, so all the Israelites went to the Philistines to sharpen their plowshares and their mattoxes, their mattoxes and axes and sickles. The price was two thirds of a shekel for plowshares and mattox, and one third for a shekel for a pitchfork and axes, and um, and for putting a point on an ox goad. So on the day of battle, not a sword or a spear could be found in the hand of any of the troops who were with Saul, uh, with Saul and Jonathan. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had weapons. Now a Philistine garrison took control of the pass at Michmash. Now we go on to verse, chapter fourteen, verse one. That same day, Saul's son Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapons, "Come on, let's cross over to the Philistine garrison on the other side." However, he did not tell his father. Saul was staying under the pomegranate tree at Migron on the outskirts of Gibeah. The troops uh, with him numbered about 600. Um, Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod, was also there. He was the son of Ahitab, the brother of Ichabod, son of uh, Phinehas, son of Eli, the Lord's priest at Shiloh. But the troops did not know that Jonathan had left. There were sharp columns of rocks on both sides of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine garrison. One was named Bozes and the other Shinnah. One stood to the north in front of Michmash and the other to the south in front of Gibeah. Jonathan said to the, to the attendant who carried his weapons, Come on, let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So you can stop right there and you can see that Jonathan didn't know for sure that God was going to go with him, but he knew it didn't matter how many people went with him. If God was with them, it would only take two to do everything they needed because he trusted God. And we'll see this later on as uh, as we go on into the stories um, as you know through Samuel and, and, and other books and, and Kings. You'll see that uh, Jonathan was a good man. Um, in this case, the apple fell about as far from the tree as it could have because he was a good man with a good heart and became the best of friends with David, um, who eventually became king. Um, so you can see that and you can see the, that his relationship was not God, was not a national relationship. He wasn't part of the Jewish religion. He wasn't following the God of his dad. Uh, the Lord was someone who was personal to Jonathan, and he believed in him, and he believed that if God is with us, it doesn't matter if it's just two of us against a thousand, um, the big deal is that God is with us. So um, all of those are very telling signs of the kind of heart this man had. So picking up in verse 7, it says, His armor bearer responded, Do what is in your heart, you choose. I'm right here with you, whatever you decide. All right, Jonathan replied, We'll cross over to the men, and then let them see us. If they say, wait until we reach you, then we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come on up, then we'll go up because the Lord has handed them over to us. That will be our sign. They let themselves be seen by the Philistine garrison. And the Philistine said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes that they've been hiding in. The men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer saying, come on up and we'll teach you a lesson, they said. Follow me, Jonathan told his armor bearer, for the Lord has handed them over to Israel. <clears throat> Jonathan um, went up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer behind him. Jonathan cut them down and his armor bearer followed and finished them off. In that first assault, Jonathan is an ar and his armor bearer struck down about 20 men in a half acre field. Terror spread throughout the Philistine camp and the open fields to all the troops. Even the garrison and the raiding parties were terrified. The earth shook and the terror of God spread. When, is, when Saul's watchmen in Gibeah and Benj uh, Benjamin looked, they saw the panicking troops scattering in every direction. So Saul said to the troops with him, Call the roll and determine who has left us. Because he could tell that obviously someone from Israel had gone over there and he didn't know who. Because remember, as we read earlier, his son didn't tell him that he left. They called at the roll and, and saw that Jonathan and his armor bearer were gone. Saul told uh, um, Aijah, bring the ark of God, for it was with the, the Israelites at that time. While Saul 
spoke to the priest, the panic of the Philistine camp increased in intensity. So Saul said to the priest, Stop what you're doing. Saul and all the troops were with, who were with him assembled and marched into battle, and there the Philistines were fighting against each other in great confusion. There were Hebrews from the area, era, area who had gone earlier into the camp to join the Philistines, but even they wound up joining the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelite men who, were, who had been hiding in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they also joined Saul and Jonathan in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day. The, bat the battle extended beyond beth and the men of Israel were worn out that day, for Saul had placed the troops under an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food before evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. Now stop right there. Notice that Saul is already in the position. We get little clues like this as we go, but this is one of them, uh, that Saul is becoming self-absorbed. This is not the, the, like other judges, they would have said the enemies of Israel. But Saul is saying, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. It's all about Saul in his mind. So, so none of the troops tasted any food. Everyone went into the forest and there was honey on the ground. When the troops entered the forest, they saw the flow of honey, but none of them made any of it because they feared the oath. However, Jonathan had not heard his father make the troops swear the oath. So he reached down with the end of his staff um, he was carrying and dipped it in the honeycomb. When he ate the honey, he had renewed energy. Then one of the troops said, Your father made the troops solemnly swear. Cursed is the man who eats food today. And the troops, were, uh, the troops are exhausted. Jonathan replied, My father has brought trouble in the land. Just look at how I have renewed energy because I tasted a little bit of honey. How much better if the troops had, uh, had eaten freely today, today from the plunder that they took from their enemies. Then the slaughter of the Philistines would have been much greater. The Israelites struck down the Philistines that day from Michmash all the way to um, Aegelon. Since the Israelites were completely exhausted, they rushed to the plunder, took sheep, cattle, and calves, slaughtered them on the ground, and ate the meat while the blood was still in it. Some, uh, some reported this to Saul. Look, the troops are, are sinning against the Lord by eating meat with the blood still in it. Hopefully you guys remember that was against the law to do, right? Saul said, you have been unfaithful. Roll a large stone over here at once. He then said, go among the troops and say to them, each man must bring me his ox and his sheep. Do the slaughtering here and then you can eat. Don't sin against the Lord by eating meat with the blood in it. So every one of the troops brought his ox uh, that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul <clears throat> built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had built an altar to the Lord. Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines tonight and plunder them until morning. Don't let one remain. Do whatever you want, the troops replied. But the priest said, We must consult God here. So this is another place where we're beginning to see an example of sphere authority. And that's going to show up a lot once we get into the other um, second book of Samuels and King and Chronicles. Um We've talked about this in the past. We protect it, particularly first talked about it in our church largely when we're going through the Truth Project. Now, God gives a delegated authority, but those authorities have spheres, and they don't. They go to a certain level, but they don't extend beyond that. Like with Saul, his authority was all over all of Israel, and so he could say things that even affected the priests. But he did not have a right to do the job of a priest. He did not have the, the right to go into where the priests were and wear an ephod and to, to eat um, the meat that was sacrificed to, um, uh, to God on the altar. There's a lot of things he couldn't do because his fear ended at the temple door. The priest had authority that, the, that Saul did not have, that the king did not have. And it also extended to some degree over their king. And so the priests were not, this was, they, I'm sure they said it with respect. Uh, uh, due to his office, but they were making it very, very clear that this is not optional. You need to stop what you're doing, back up, because before we go further, I mean, God gave the okay to do what we've done up to this point, but now you're wanting to go in and pursue the troops after God's already given us a victory, and that's fine if God gives us the okay, but we need to seek God, and we need to do it here, and we need to do it now. So Saul, well, he capitulated. He did what they said. 
So Saul inquired of the Lord, Should I go after the Philistines? Will you hand them over to Israel? But God did not answer him that day. So Saul said, All you leaders of the troops, come here. Let us investigate how the sin has occurred today. As surely as the Lord lives, who, sa who, um, who saves Israel, even if it is because of my own son Jonathan, he must die. Not one of the troops answered him. So he said uh, to all of Israel, You will be on one side, and I, will be, and I, my son Jonathan, will be on the other side. And the troops replied, Do whatever you want. So Saul said to the Lord, God of Israel, give us the right decision. Jonathan and Saul were selected, and the troops were, uh, were cleared of the charge. Then Saul said, Cast the lots between me and my son Jonathan, and Jonathan was selected. Now, just so you know what was going on here, he's trying to investigate and find out what is it that's caused the problem here. And, uh, and uh, so, was it somebody in Israel, or was it somebody in leadership here, my son or myself? And when, and when uh, Saul and his son were selected, then that's when they casted the lot, and the lot fell on Jonathan. So Saul commanded him, Tell me what you did. And then Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of the staff I was carrying. I am ready to die. Saul declared to him, May God punish me severely if you do not die, Jonathan. But the people said to Saul, Must, die, must Jonathan, uh, Jonathan die, who accomplished such a great deliverance for Israel? No, as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, for he worked with God's help today. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not, and he did not die. Now I want us to stop right there also and look at this. This was not the lot falling on Jonathan was not because of the fact that God was not not answering Saul because Jonathan sinned um, in eating honey. He uh, now Jonathan did sin in that he did not consult his father who was king. As king, he was commander of the armies of Israel. He had no right, even though God um, uh, blessed his efforts, he needed to do it through the approval of his father, and he didn't do it, not just his father, but his commander and his king. Um, but he didn't know about the oath, um, uh, about not eating. And so the problem was that the, it wasn't so much that uh, there was a problem with what actually happened as much as the people knew that he broke, broke the rule. And uh, Jonathan knew that he had broken a rule that he had not previously known about, but Saul did not know. And later on, this could come up and, and bite them in the rear end, you know, because there's going to be a, a, a declaration of favoritism against it for his son and stuff like that. So it was something that the if it wasn't addressed now, the temple could ease, the, the, the nation could easily become divided against itself, and this needed to be dealt with. And so, and this is a lesson for us as well. It's a sub-lesson, but it's still a lesson. Any group of people that God has placed together, whether it be a marriage or a family, or whether it be a church, or whether it be a business, or whatever it happens to be, if the people are divided, then when you go forward, as you try to go forward, you're going to be um, conquered. Uh, in the end, it will not work. Uh, and that's the reason why, and I've told you this before, this is why most, uh, the most unsuccessful uh, form of business that there is, is a partnership. And it's not because a partnership can't work, it's because partnerships are, are have two humans in them, at least. And they don't communicate necessarily. It, it's a loose affiliation. Now, if it were like a board of directors and they had shareholders, then there's a lot of accountability there and it works better because you know you can't make unilateral, unilateral decisions without clearing it through the board. But if you just have a partnership, well, then you become so invested in what you're doing and it feels like the, the business belongs to you. And a lot of times you wind up making decisions behind the scenes the other doesn't know about. And before you know it, you're sabotaging yourself because you're kind of running in opposite directions at the same time. And uh, so this is something that needed to be addressed. So, um, and I want you to also see Jonathan's heart again. Um, Jonathan did not say, well, you know, wait a minute, I didn't know about it, Dad, you know, or I didn't know about it, King. You know, that shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't be held liable to this. Instead, he said, you know what? I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff I was carrying. I'm ready to die. If that's what's necessary, because you gave a decree, I'm ready to die. Um, you know, these people had a level of nobility that, again, people in America would have a hard time wrapping their head around. But um, 
this young man was willing to die if that's what it was necessary to go forward and Israel to prosper. Um, but all and 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 the king, to his credit, I mean, Saul was not all bad at this point. He had some good points. I mean, he wanted to make sure that things were cleared through God. Now, I mean, he'd gotten kind of a verbal whipping by. Um, Samuel by not doing that, but he was kind of learning his lesson, though his heart wasn't in the right place still. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like you and I. And what the scriptures talk about um, carnal or baby Christians, uh, Saul would have fallen in that category. It's not that Saul didn't care at all what God said, and it's not that he didn't want or desire God's approval or God's intervention. He recognized that if God wasn't with him, there would be problems, and he wanted God um, involved, but he was not a true worshiper of God. And uh, so he would have been considered a nominal Christian if Christianity was the name of Judaism at the time. And so, um, you know, so he's doing the things, you know, some things that are right, even to the point of, if it requires that my own son die in order that we go forward, well then... May God punish me severely if he doesn't, you know. These are these are actually statements of nobility, and it's a good thing. But then all of Israel intercedes on his behalf, and uh, so it winds up not coming out. And that's and the reason why I wanted to point that out is because this the reason why I know this is not a matter of justice, meaning absolute rights and absolute wrongs, is because of the fact that they go on and they win, and God seems to be behind this decision. Whereas if it had been an absolute wrong, God would have expected judgment. So um, so clearly this was something that was just a matter that needed to be cleared up so that the nation itself, and particularly its leadership, was not divided before they went into battle. Um, so that's that's an important lesson to learn. So anyway, so let's uh, pick up in verse uh, 46. It says, Then Saul gave, uh, gave, up the, uh, gave up the pursuit to the Philistines, and the Philistines returned to their own territory. When Saul assumed the kingship over Israel, he fought against all his enemies in every direction, against Moab, um, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Z Zeboah, and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he caused havoc. He, caused, um, he fought bravely, defeated the Amalekites, and delivered Israel from the hand of those who plundered them. Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishva, and Malkishua. The names of his two daughters were Mereb, his firstborn, and Michael, his younger. The name of Saul's wife was, um, I think it's ah Ahinoab, or, I mean Ahinoam, I mean, it's hard to say that, uh, daughter of Ahamaz. The name of the commander of his army was Abner, son of Saul's um, uh, uncle Nir. Saul's father was Kish. Abner's father, wa uh, father, near, uh, father was Nir of Abiel. The conflict of the Philistines was fierce all of Saul's days. So whenever Saul noticed any strong or brave man, he chose to enlist him. So Because he always wanted someone strong on his side. Now on to chapter 15. Um, but I wanted to point out also real quickly, you notice that another thing that was good about Saul was that he was a good commander. And he was very brave. Um, he didn't just send people in battle, he went with them. He spearheaded the effort, and Jonathan evidently was in that regard like his father. So um, in uh, chapter 15, it says, Samuel told Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people Israel. Now listen to the words of the Lord. This is what the Lord of hosts says. I witnessed that the Amalekites, what the Amalekites did to the Israelites when they opposed them along the way as they were coming up out of Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare them. Kill men and women, children and infants, ox and sheep, camels and donkeys. Then Saul summoned the troops and counted them at uh, Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men from Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set up an ambush in um, uh, in Wadi, which is like the Wadi Desert. He, uh, he warned the Kenites, since you showed kindness to all of Israel when we came through, uh, came out of Egypt, go on and leave. Get away from the Amalekites or I'll sweep you away with them. So the Kenites withdrew from the Amalekites. Again, that's just another example where Israel was in some ways like their God. Um, they were mindful of people that did right to them and were kind to them 
and gave them fair warnings. Um, now, it wasn't a super great warning because he's like, you know, we wouldn't kill you one way or the other. You're just going to make it easier for us if you leave. He's like, you know what? We're going to go through there. We're not going to be checking to see who's who. So I'm giving you a chance now to leave because otherwise you're going to get killed with everybody else. But the point is, he remembered his history, which is a big deal. He remembered his history because you remember when they came out of Egypt, that was generations ago for Saul. He wasn't there. And literally, you need to understand that was further away to Saul than the founding of our nation is to you and I. But he knew their history. It was important to know that. And so he honored those that honored Israel and gave them a chance to get out. So that's, I think that's important. Um, then in, uh, let's see, verse uh, 7. Then Saul struck down the Amalekites from um, Hevila Hiv all the way to Shur, um, which is next to Egypt. He captured Agad, king of, Amal of um, Amalek, alive, but he completely destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. Saul and the troops spared Agag and the best of the sheep, cattle, and fatlings, as well as the young rams and the best of everything else. They were not willing to destroy them. That's a key word. It's not that they didn't know they were supposed to. They weren't willing to. But they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from following me and has not carried out my instructions. So Samuel became angry and cried out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up to confront Saul, but it was reported to Samuel. Saul, uh, what was, I'm sorry, what was it? Report, but it was reported to Samuel. Saul went to Carmel where he um, set up a monument for himself. Then he turned around and went back down to Gilgal. When Samuel came to him, Saul said, May the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instruction. Samuel replied, Then what is the sound of sheep and cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The troops. They brought them back from the Malachites and spared the best of the sheep and the cattle in order to offer a sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we destroyed. Now look at that again. This is this is something you sometimes see in more, um, dare I say, childish um, marriages, where um, uh, you know, every, when everything's going right, there are kids, and when things go wrong, it's your child. Um, and here he says, you know what, uh, you know, the troops, they're the ones that brought the, the back up from the Malachites and spared the best of sheep, the cattle, in order to offer a sacrifice to the Lord, your God. He's not, he's not claiming God as his God, but Samuel's God. But the rest we destroyed. Samuel was angry and he yelled out, Stop! Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, he replied. Samuel continued, Although you once considered yourself unimportant, you have, not, have you not become the leader of the tribes of Israel? Now, let's stop right there. Two things were being brought up. And I told you this last time. Um, remember, Saul, when it came time to be pulled forward to be inaugurated as king, they had to find him because he was hiding. He, he didn't feel self-confident and, uh, and, and, and there, and he considered himself to be unimportant. And this is uh, validated right here. He said, although once you considered yourself unimportant, it was the words out of his own mouth. I'm from the smallest tribe and the most insignificant family of that tribe. Um, but also... Samuel's pointing out, it doesn't matter how insignificant you were or how insignificant you considered yourself, you're no longer in a position where you've got the right to look at yourself that way. You have become the leader of the tribes of Israel. In other words, you need to put your big boy pants on and realize that what you do is under scrutiny of an entire nation. You can't be acting this way. And uh, and But also, I want you to notice that that was the basis of for God's former judgment that the kingdom was going to be taken away from him and given to another. Because of the fact that even though he might have considered himself unimportant up to this point, he was becoming self-important in his own mind. And God had to judge him not as just an Israelite, but as a leader. Uh, a comparable verse under the New Covenant says, you know, don't many of you seek to be teachers because they will receive a stricter judgment. Because when you have been given authority over more things, 
God expects more out of you. To who much is given, much is required, the Bible says. So he says, you have, have you not become a leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel and then sent you on a mission and said, go and completely destroy the sinful Amalekites. Fight against them until you have annihilated all of, uh, I'm sorry, annihilated all of them. So why did you, uh, why didn't you obey the Lord? Why did you rush on the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul answered. I went on the mission the Lord gave me, and I brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I completely destroyed the the Amalekites. The troops took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder, the best of what was set apart for destruction, um, uh, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Now, I want you to notice here, not only is Saul rushing to his own defense, but, you know, God already saw where this was going by answering it to begin with. He said, although you once considered yourself important, you have been, uh, become the leader. And yet here he's trying to claim, well, I'm not really responsible because the people did it, you know? Uh, I really can't be held responsible for what the people did. You know, he, he's not acting very kingly at all. Um, he says, you know, and, and he's trying to defend himself. I mean, he just got done, so just got done saying, why did you not um, uh, fight against the Amal Amalekites and destroy every last one of them, annihilate them all. And he's like, I did. And the next words out of his mouth is, I brought back the king alive. Well, then that wouldn't be all of them, would it? You know, this is another problem that, and we're seeing it in today's society as well. And it's it's just as true in, in, in churches or and among Christians as it is among the lost, but it's more true among the lost than it is even among Christians because their minds are so incredibly darkened. You have people that that honestly cannot see. Their eyes are so blinded that the obvious completely eludes them. Right here, he just got done saying, annihilate them all. And he tells them, I did. I did everything God told me, and I brought back the king. You know, it's like the elevator's not reaching the top here. You know, it's like the guy just doesn't get it. And but and then he and so I mean he he blames the troops bringing back the sheep and the cattle, but he owns the fact that he's the one that brought back the king. And somehow in his mind, that is not going against not annihilating everyone, because his mind is becoming dark. And and I, it's a war. It serves as a warning to you and I, because I'm telling you. When we don't serve the Lord with all of our hearts, if we do not honor him in all of our ways, we our reasoning becomes as dark as this man's. And what is obvious to someone who's standing by is as blind to you as possible. So we have to be very, very careful about these things. Go on to verse 22. It says, Then Samuel said, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Saul answered Samuel, I have sinned. I have transgressed the Lord's commands and your words. Because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. Stop. So, look at this. He had an opportunity to own up to what he had done, and he didn't do it. When he realized Samuel and God wasn't, weren't buying it, and he pressed him on the issue, then all of a sudden he scrambles, and he owns that he sinned, and I've transgressed the Lord's, uh, Lord's commands and, uh, and your words, and he owns the fact that he did it because he was afraid of the people so I obeyed them. When he said that, he was telling the truth. He was afraid of the people. Because regardless of how big and bad Saul had become, he was still uh, from the smallest tribe and the smallest house and was still insignificant in his mind. And he was afraid that if he did not allow the people to do some things that they wanted to do, he, it would cost him the kingship. He was afraid. And uh, this is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Um, I'll make reference to it now only because of the fact that I've been making reference to it quite frequently recently, and that is to the book of Job. The, the, the problem that Job ran into is because he honored God in many respects, 
And yet there were some things that he did because he was afraid. And the reason why he was afraid was because he's afraid of losing what God gave him. He was afraid of losing his abundant wealth. He was afraid of losing all the things that he had. He was afraid of losing his kids who were all living ungodly lives and living in debauchery. And so he was offering sacrifices on their behalf as though he could offer sacrifices for his kids without his kids repenting. He was living in perpetual fear over things that he was, should have been trusting God about. And that fear drives us to behavior that is beneath us and is contrary to trust. And it's something that God will judge. In verse 25, it says, Now, therefore, please forgive my sin and return with me so I can worship the Lord. Now, there, there doesn't seem to ever be an end to Saul's duplicity. Because he's, he's, he's like, well, hey, I've admitted I was wrong. I've told you why I did it. Okay, just forgive me. Let go of the sin. And come on, put your arm around me, brother, and let's go back and worship the Lord together as though I never did anything wrong. And Samuel replied to Saul, he says, you know what? I will not return with you because you rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from becoming king over Israel. When Samuel turned to go, Saul grabbed the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel then turned and said to him, the Lord has torn the kingship of Israel away from you and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you are. Therefore, forevermore, the eternal one of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man who changes his mind. Saul said, I have sinned. Please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so I can bow and worship the Lord your God. Now, again, he's calling him your God, and he's, he's admitting his sin, but the reason why he wants him to go down there is because he's concerned about how he's going to appear in front of the people. Now, it says, Then Samuel went back and followed Saul, and Saul bowed down to the Lord. So Samuel wound up going with him. I don't know whether that was the best decision or not. That doesn't tell us. Uh, I think he probably would have been better off sticking with his first decision. Um, but he did go, for better or for worse. And it doesn't tell us the outcome, but it says, Then Samuel went back follow, uh, following Saul, and Saul went, uh, bowed down to the, uh, to the Lord. Samuel said, Bring me Agag, king of Amalek. Agag came to him trembling, for he thought in his mind, Certainly the bitter bitterness of death has come to me. Samuel declared, As your sword has made women childless, so your mother will be childless among women. Then he hacked Agag into pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Samuel then went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Even to this day, even to the day of his death, Samuel never visited Saul again. Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, the biggest lesson of these chapters, and one of the most pertinent of all of Scripture, is that mankind is often more concerned over the opinion of man than over the opinion of God. And no one, no one is exempt from that temptation on one area of life or another. Ironically, some of the people most held um, uh, in positions of adoration among us are also the most feeble in terms of self-evaluation and need. Um, uh, you know, When we look at people who are in positions of authority or are lauded for their talent or are like Saul, who was uh, tall and good looking and, you know, more so than any of the men in Israel. You, you, you have a tendency in your mind to think, wow, that person's really got a great self-esteem and man, I want to be like them. And you kind of idolize them and stuff like that. Believe it or not, the greatest majority of them, the greatest majority of them are absolutely the most depressed and uh, and and uh, self-confident people, um, meaning in other words, self-conscious people that you've ever met. Uh, uh, you know, especially this is very very true in Hollywood. Uh, the actors thrive on the approval of others. Uh, that the, they make it their their they're living by that, and they they plummet to the depths of despair without it. Um, uh, it's 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 a type of petty idolatry. 
Uh, actors many times openly admit to craving the approval and applause of other people. They crave attention and, and, and admiration, or they sink into depression and self-loathing and drug use and overspending to the point of near destitution along um, uh, with many other base behaviors if they don't get it. Uh, if you ever follow up the career of a lot of actors, you'll find that between big acting gigs, they often go into downward spirals of depression. Um, you often won't hear about it unless, of course, they get so bad that they have to go to rehab. Um, or, you know, somebody catches news of the fact that they literally were kicked out of their mansion because they couldn't make rent. Um, you often don't find that these also have a tendency to correspond with times when actors have, often, like I said, not had work. And all of a sudden you see big names start doing um, commercials for, you know, car insurance and stuff like that just to make ends meet. Um, you know... The reason why is because they have so little self-esteem. And here Saul was among the most handsome men in all Israel and had the initial approval of God, the prophet, and the entire kingdom. And yet he lived in fear and ruled in fear of rejection. Um, a verse I mentioned on Sunday applies very well here. Paul had come to the point where he didn't care what other people thought. And I don't mean in that, you know obnoxious way. Well, I don't care what you think. I don't mean like that. Paul just had come to a settled place in his heart that God is my only judge, and he's, his opinion is the only one that matters. And he said in first, it's recorded in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, and again, I said this on Sunday. It says, it is of little, it is of little importance that I should be evaluated by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even evaluate myself, for I am not conscious of anything against myself. But I'm not justified by this. The only one who evaluates me is the Lord. Um, Jesus said, as I've pointed out recently as well, Beware when all men speak well of you, because that's how they spoke to your forefathers, the prophets. And uh, Proverbs 29, verse 25 through 26 says, The fear of man is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. Many seek a ruler's favor, but a man receives justice from God. And the last one I want to give you is found in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And that is, when all has been heard, the conclusion of the whole matter of life is this. Fear God and keep his commandments, because this is the whole duty of man. It is That right there is completely short-circuited when you and I begin to honor man above God. Jesus is, uh, said uh, one of the things I've brought up many times in here, 